Hey guys, Craig here and welcome back to my channel. So in today's video I'm going to tell you the story of Leopold and Loeb. So how did two charismatic and intelligent guys with such bright futures go on to commit such heinous acts? Well grab yourself a drink and we'll get into it. Nathan Leopold was born on the 19th of November 1904 in Chicago and he was the son of a wealthy Jewish immigrant family. It is said that he was a child prodigy and he claimed to have spoken his first words at the age of only four months. At the time of the murders, Leopold had completed an undergraduate degree at the University of Chicago and he graduated with honours and planned to go on to study at the Harvard School of Law. He also reportedly spoke 15 languages and was fluent in five of them. Leopold also had a fascination with all things bird related and he would actually go on to identify a new species of bird called the Kirtland Wobbler. So Richard Loeb was also born in Chicago on the 11th of June 1905 and he had extremely wealthy parents. His father was a lawyer and his mother was a retired vice president of a chain of department stores. His father was of Jewish descent and his mother was a Catholic. But just like Leopold, Loeb was exceptionally intelligent and with the encouragement of his governess, Loeb skipped several grades in school and became the University of Michigan's youngest graduate at the age of only 17. Loeb was also especially fond of history and was doing a graduate degree in the subject at the time of his death. But unlike Leopold, Loeb was not overly interested in intellectual pursuits. He preferred to spend time socialising with friends, playing tennis and reading detective novels. So both young men grew up with their respected families in the affluent Kenwood neighbourhood on Chicago's south side. The Loeb family owned a summer estate which they would call Castle Farms and this was in addition to their Kenwood mansion which was only two blocks away from the Leopold home. Although Leopold and Loeb knew each other casually when growing up, they began to see a lot more of each other in the mid-1920s and a relationship between the two flourished at the University of Chicago when they both discovered that they had a mutual interest in true crime. Leopold was particularly fascinated by a German philosopher whose concept of Superman intrigued him. He liked the concept of posing extraordinary and unusual capabilities. And he also liked to think that superior intellect allowed them to rise above laws and rules that bound normal society. Leopold would actually go on to think that he and Loeb were indeed Superman. He would go on to think that the pair were not bound by any of society's ethics or laws. And in a letter to Loeb, Leopold wrote, A superman is on account of a certain superior quality, and he is exempt from ordinary laws which govern the normal man. And because of this, he would not be liable for anything that he would do. So the pair began asserting their perceived immunity from normal restrictions with all sorts of petty crimes. Such crimes as theft and vandalism. They would also frequently break into fraternity houses at the University of Michigan, where on one occasion they would steal a camera and a typewriter. This typewriter would come in handy for the pair at a later date. But despite their crimes, no one really seemed to notice, and the pair were disappointed with the lack of media coverage that their crimes got. So they decided to execute a plan to commit a sensational crime, or a perfect crime as they liked to call it. They were desperate to garner some kind of public attention to confirm their self-perceived status of Superman. So Leopold, who was 19 years old at the time of the crimes, and Loeb, who was 18, settled on kidnap and murder as their perfect crime. They spent seven months planning everything from the method of abduction to the disposal of the body. They then deceived a plan to make a ransom demand 
and they devised a detailed plan of collecting it, involving a long series of complex delivery instructions communicated one at a time over the telephone. They would then type out the final set of instructions involving the actual ransom money drop-off point and they would use the typewriter that they stole to do this. They had also decided at this point that a chisel would be selected as the perfect murder weapon. So after a lengthy search for a suitable victim, mostly in and around the grounds of Harvard School for Boys, they decided upon Robert Bobby Franks, the 14-year-old son of a wealthy Chicago watchmaker. Lobe knew Bobby Franks pretty well because he was actually his second cousin and he lived just across the street from each other. So the pair put their plan into motion on the afternoon of May 21st, 1924. And using a car that Leopold had rented under the name Morton D. Ballard, they offered Bobby a ride home as he walked home from school. But Bobby initially refused since his destination was less than two blocks away. But Loeb convinced him to get into the car after discussing a tennis racket that he had been using. The precise sequence of events that followed remains highly disputed, but it is widely believed that Leopold was behind the wheel of the car while Loeb sat in the back seat with the chisel. It is then says that Loeb struck Bobby Frank several times in the head with the chisel, then dragged him into the back where he gagged him. But shortly after, Bobby Franks would die due to his injuries. So with the body now on the floor out of sight, Leopold and Loeb drove to their predetermined dumping spot, which was 25 miles south of Chicago. And after nightfall, they removed, discarded Bobby Frank's clothes. They then concealed him in a small channel that allowed water to flow underneath a road. At this point, they proceeded to pour hydrochloric acid all over Bobby's face to try and disfigure him in a hope that no one could identify the body. By the time that both men returned to Chicago, word had already started to spread about Bobby Frank's disappearance. Leopold then called Bobby's mother and identified himself as George Johnson, and he proceeded to tell her that Bobby had been kidnapped and that she had to wait for further instructions regarding a ransom. After this phone call, they typed out the ransom note and burnt the bloodstained clothes they then went on to clean any blood splat on the rental vehicle. The pair would then spend the rest of the evening playing cards. Once the Frank family received the ransom note the following morning, Leopold called the Franks again to dictate the first set of ransom instructions. But the detailed plan stalled almost immediately after a nervous family member forgot the address of the store where they were supposed to receive the next set of instructions and the plan was abandoned altogether when word actually came that Bobby Frank's body had indeed been found. After this, Leopold and Loeb would go on to destroy the typewriter and burn a blanket that they had used to move Bobby's body. The pair then tried to go about their lives as normal, but the Chicago police launched an incentive investigation and a reward was offered for any information regarding Bobby's death. While Loeb went about his daily routine pretty quietly, Leopold spoke freely to police and reporters offering his theories to anybody that would listen. He would even tell one detective that if he were to murder somebody, it would be that cocky son of a bitch, Bobby Franks. Police would later find a pair of glasses near where Bobby's body was found. And although they were a common prescription, they were fitted with an unusual hinge purchased by only three people in the whole of Chicago, one of whom was Leopold. So when police questioned Leopold about this, he offered the possibility that his glasses might have dropped out of his pocket during a birdwatching trip the previous weekend. But at this point, the destroyed typewriter was recovered from a Jackson Park lagoon on June 7th. And because of this, the two men were summoned for formal questioning on May 29th. They went on to say that on the night of the murders they had picked up two women in Chicago using Leopold's car and then dropped them off somewhere near a golf course without ever learning their names. But their alibi was exposed as a fabrication 
when Leopold's chauffeur told police that he was repairing Leopold's car on the night that the men claimed to use it. The chauffeur's wife later confirmed that the car was indeed parked in Leopold's garage on the night of the murder. So Loeb's confession came first and he insisted that Leopold had planned everything and that he had killed Bobby in the back seat of the car while Loeb himself was driving. Leopold's confession followed swiftly after, but he insisted that he was the driver and that Loeb was the murderer. Despite this, their confessions otherwise corroborated most of the evidence that police already had. Leopold later claimed in his book, long after Loeb was dead, that he pleaded in vain with Loeb to admit to killing Bobby. But while most observers believe that Loeb did indeed strike the fatal blow, some circumstantial evidence, including a testimony from an eyewitness who says that she saw Loeb driving the car and that Leopold was in the back seat, this suggests that Leopold could have indeed been the killer. Both Leopold and Loeb stated that they were driven by their thrill-seeking pretense of the perfect crime, but neither claimed to have looked forward to the actual killing itself. So the trial of Leopold and Loeb at Chicago's Cookhouse Courthouse became a media spectacular and it was labelled the trial of the century. Loeb's family hired Clarence Darrow, one of the most renowned criminal defence lawyers in the country. It was rumoured that Darrow was paid one million dollars for his service and the reason he decided to take the case was because he was strongly against capital punishment. It was generally assumed that the men's defence would be based on a plea of not guilty by reason of insanity. Darrell's concluded that a jury trial would almost certainly end in conviction and the death penalty. Thus, he elected for a plea of guilty, hoping to convince the judge to impose a life sentence rather than death. So the trial, or technically the sentence hearing, ran for 32 days the state's attorney, Robert E. Crow, presided over a hundred witness documents detailing the crimes. The defence presented psychiatric testimonies in an effort to establish mitigating circumstances, including childhood neglect in the form of absent parents, and in Leopold's case, sexual abuse by the hands of a governess. Darrow also called a series of expert witnesses who offered a catalogue of Leopold and Loeb's abnormalities. One witness testified that their minds must be so dysfunctional to lead them to the crime that they committed. Clarence Darrow's passionate 12 hour long masterful plea at the conclusion of the hearing has been called the finest of his career. In principle, the theme of the plea was the inhumane punishment of the American justice system and the wasted life of the youths involved. After hearing that, the judge was persuaded and he did go on to say that his ruling and his decision was based on the youth of the accused. So after 12 days on September 10th, 1924, he sentenced both Leopold and Loeb to life in prison for the murder of Bobby Franks, plus 99 years for his kidnap. Leopold and Loeb were initially held at the same prison, but they were kept separate as much as possible. But despite this, the two did manage to maintain a strong friendship behind bars. So Leopold was later transferred to the Stateville Penitentiary, and Loeb was eventually transferred there as well. Once the pair were reunited, the two expanded the prison school scheme. But then, on January 28, 1936, Loeb was attacked by a fellow inmate, James Day. He attacked him with a serrated razor while he was in the shower, and he died soon after. James Day claimed that Loeb had assaulted him, although he was unharmed, and Loeb himself had more than 50 wounds, including defensive wounds, to his arms and hands. His throat had also been slit from behind. Leopold continued with his work in prison after Loeb's death, but it is noted that he suffered from a deep depression. He then became a model prisoner and made significant contributions to improving the conditions at the penitentiary. 
These included recognising that the present library needed revamped and that the skill and system for teaching needed to be improved. He would also go on to volunteer to work in the prison hospital. Also then, in 1944, Leopold volunteered for the Stateville Penitentiary Malaria Study, where he was deliberately injected with malaria and then subjected to several experimental treatments to try and cure it. Leopold's autobiography, Life Plus 99 Years, was also published in 1958. And after 33 years and numerous unsuccessful parole petitions, Leopold was finally released on March 1958. In April of that year, he attempted to set up the Leopold Foundation to be funded by the Royal Aids from his autobiography in an aid to help emotionally disturbed youths. But the state of Illinois voided this on the grounds that it violated the terms of his parole. Sadly, Leopold would go on to die of a diabetes-related heart attack on August 29, 1971, at the age of 66. So guys, that was the story of Leopold and Loeb. Let me know in the comment section below if you think that they should have received the death penalty for what they've done. And if you like this video, don't forget to give it a big thumbs up and subscribe to the channel. And I will see you all next time for another video. Bye!